I will ask us to turn to the book of First Samuel chapter 2. First Samuel chapter 2 from where the evening sermon will be coming from. And I'll, we will consider verse 1 to 11. First Samuel chapter 2. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 1, all the way to 11. And I read. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I, rejoiced, I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is fallen. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts up the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones. But the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, and the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, the priest. Let us ask the Lord for him to open up his word to us. O Lord, we ask you that you may open our eyes and our hearts to your word, that just as you open the heart of Lydia to the message that Paul was preaching, that the same would apply to us. Help me, O Lord, to be faithful, to be clear, and to be simple as I preach from your word. O Lord, grant me strength. Would you counsel out my weaknesses and even use them for the benefit of your people this evening? We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When we want to buy a product, one of the things we love to do is to do some window shopping. You, especially in these days when we have so much uh, online shopping, you go to Jumia or you go to other services and you try and look at this product. If you are buying, for example, uh, a new phone, you go on the internet and you type the uh, model of the phone that you want, or you type uh, the type of shoe uh, you want, and there comes the picture, and you're able to look at it and view it and appreciate maybe whether it will uh, be sufficient for your needs or uh, what you want, uh, and, and th th that viewing of that image really helps us. In the same way, even today, when we want to, for example, uh, before we watch a program or a movie, we first of all like to watch the trailer. And that trailer gives us a view of what we want to watch so that we can either know whether we are interested in it or not. It will not tell us everything in the same way that a picture that you see online will not tell you, will not give you the full idea of uh, how the product is, but you will be able to get an understanding of what you want just by looking at 
the image. And so this evening, I want us to look through the eyes of Hannah in this prayer or in this song. And I want us to have or to, have, to look at a view of the kingdom of God. Because this prayer, okay, the book of Samuel has many recorded prayers in it. These are not there to only teach us how to pray. But they are there to teach us about the object of prayer. And that is God and his sovereign reign over his creation. So the prayers of the Bible are not there simply for us to know the words to, we need to use in prayer. They are very helpful in that. But they also serve a much greater purpose. And that is to tell us more about God himself and his kingdom. As one commentator puts it, Hannah, in her prayer, is inspired to discern in her own individual experience the universal laws of the divine economy and to recognize that it is significant, uh, rather, uh, and to recognize uh, its significance for the whole cause of the kingdom of God. In other words, her prayer here is an experience of God's kingdom in her own life. And as we look at this prayer, it will give us a view of what God is doing as he reigns over his creation. What is the kingdom of God? What does it involve? Because we often uh, like saying that word, the kingdom of God. May your kingdom come. But what does the kingdom of God mean? I hope that as we look at this prayer this evening, that we will be able to get a view, to get a bird's eye view of the kingdom of God and appreciate what he is doing, not only in the world or the universe, but even in our own individual lives. So I would like us to see, first of all, that the Lord, in his governance of creation, the Lord who reigns, the Lord saves his people. That as God rules this universe, he's a God who works out all things for the salvation of his elect. And we see this in verse 1 to 3. Look at what Hannah says in verse 1. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. In her prayer, Hannah begins by presenting her experience of God's salvation. She praises Yahweh as the sole giver of salvation. She has seen God's salvation in aiding her in a number of ways. The Lord has aided her, has helped her in her barrenness. The Lord has also helped her and saved her from the mockery of her rival at home. And remember, these mockeries of Penina made her to feel pain, not only at home, but also when she would go to worship. The Lord saved her from much pain. But she also speaks as an Israelite. So she not only speaks individually about what the Lord has done in her experiences at home, but, uh, and, and also uh, in her experiences when she would go to worship. But the Lord has also saved her in the context of the nation of Israel. She's speaking here as an Israelite who has experienced the saving grace of God from the nations surrounding Israel which have been attacking them. Again, remember that Hannah is living at what time? This is the times of the judges. 
And if you read throughout the book of the Judges, what you will notice is that there is always a cycle that the people would turn away from God and then what would happen? Then God would send neighboring nations to come and attack them and subdue them and enslave them. And then they would cry to the Lord and the Lord would raise a savior for them. So she's also crying out. She's also rejoicing. She's also joyful of the fact that she has experienced, she has seen God's people being saved from the surrounding nations. The armies of the Canaanite nations being defeated. But Hannah praises the Lord on top of that. He praises the Lord, not just by looking at what he has done, but who he is. And it is very important that we see that in her prayers. She points to who God is. Look at verse 2. There is none holy like the Lord. So she's not just pointing to what she has seen the Lord do, but she's also looking at who this God is. Because God's actions and God's attributes are connected. Because God is holy, because God is faithful, he will therefore act on behalf of his people. He will keep his promise to deliver his people from their enemies. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Look at verse 3. For the Lord is a God of knowledge. So she points to the attributes of God. And she especially points to his holiness and his omniscience. The fact that God is holy and the fact that God knows all. God's attribute of holiness makes him a sure rock of salvation. He is dependable. We can trust in him. We can hope in him. Why? The word holy in Hebrew is actually the word different or other. Holy doesn't just mean pure. It means that God is other. God is different. Other or different from what? Other or different from humans. Other and different from anything in creation. And that's why God cannot be compared to anything in creation. We cannot create an image to represent the Lord. God, Yahweh, he is other, he is holy. Whenever you hear that word, God is holy. Remember that word, God is other, God is different. He is unlike anything in creation. And because of this, because God is not like anything in creation, because things in creation, when we lean on them, they move and they can fail us. We can build big buildings that are strong and firm. But wear and tear the elements of, of nature, wind and floods and earthquakes can bring those things down. Human covenants can collapse. You can make covenants with people and they can change their mind just like that. But the Lord, he is holy. He never changes. He is the same yesterday, he is the same today, and forever. And that's why you and I can trust him. As you read the word of God, you can trust God because he is holy. His word is dependable. He does not change. He promises and he keeps his promises, because he is different. He is other in power, in greatness, 
and thus we can trust him to the end. Dear saints, this is the reason why then we ought not to be anxious. The Lord is a God of salvation. The Lord is a God who keeps his promise. The Lord is holy and he is able to do that which he has promised. He will keep us. He, he who saved you, he who began a good work in you, he is able to bring it to completion in the Lord Jesus Christ. I cannot depend on my own strength for salvation. I remember when I became a believer uh, in Form 1, one of the things I would ask myself is, I, I, I thank the Lord for this experience, but how sure am I I will be able to stay true to the end? And I'm sure you've also asked your, yourself that question. Can we depend on our own selves? No. We need to depend on the Lord. He is holy. He is able to keep us and preserve us to the end. If you are a young believer and you're listening to this, the Lord saves his people. The Lord who has saved you will keep you, will watch over you to do what he has promised in his word. But the Lord is also omniscient, and this is what she speaks about in verse 3. For the Lord is a God of knowledge. Wow, he is a God of knowledge. He is not only a God of salvation, he is not only the God who is holy, he is a God of knowledge. He is omniscient, knowing all, and nothing is hidden from him. And that's why we can, again, trust him for salvation. If God was not omniscient, if he did not know all things, it would be hard for us to trust him for salvation. Because a God who do not, doesn't know what is around the corner, who doesn't know about our sins and our weaknesses and our mistakes that we even don't know about, you do not know about your own future. But the Lord knows. He's a God of knowledge. He sees beyond the corner. He can see the challenges that are ahead of you. He can see the obstacles that are ahead of you. That's another reason why we ought not to be anxious. Because this God knows. And it's not just knows in terms of he, he has seen it, but here knowledge speaks about God orchestrating and planning all things for our good. We can trust him. Hannah here can trust the Lord. The Lord knew her. The Lord knew her deepest pains. He knew her experiences. Sometimes we tend to think that God doesn't know what we are feeling. Your husband or your wife may not know the pains in your heart. Your parents may not know the pains in your heart. Sometimes we do not even know the things that are hidden in our hearts. And that's why some, sometimes we're even surprised by what comes out of us. And you wonder, wow, I didn't know I'm capable of that kind of sin. I didn't know I was capable of such anger and bitterness. But the Lord knows you much deeper than you even know yourself. And that's why we can trust him. We trust a doctor who knows a problem, right? You don't go to a doctor who guesses. When you go to his office and you give him your symptoms, he goes to a uh, die. See, can you imagine going to an office where a doctor will now cast a die and then throws it and then says, oops, well, the die says that you have uh, asthma. Asthma it is. I'm giving you the medicine. You will probably not go there again. And if you hear someone is going there, you will tell them that's a, that's a witch doctor. That's not a doctor. 
The Lord knows you. He knows your illnesses. He knows your spiritual issues. We can trust him because of this. Our pains, our fears, our deepest needs are exposed to him. The Lord knew the pains of Hannah even when no word could be uttered out. You remember when Hannah went to pray in chapter 1? And out of deep anxiety, out of deep pain, she could not even speak out words. In verse 13, Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. And the Lord knew her. This is the God that is calling us to trust in him. He is also great, a great savior, because he knows the secret plans of his people's enemies. God also knew what the enemies of Israel were doing. She is speaking here as an Israelite, and she's saying, the Lord knows what the Philistines are planning. We might not know, but the Lord knows. The Lord knows what the Ammonites are planning. We might not know. The Lord knows and he sees and he can hear what they are whispering to one another. And that's why we can have confidence and hope in him. We can therefore rest in his salvation. For the Lord is holy in his promises and he will do that which he has said. So that's the first thing we say about the, the a view of the kingdom of God, that the Lord works for the salvation of his people. But then secondly, I want us to see from verse 4 to verse 8 that the Lord governs creation. So the Lord not only saves, but he saves us and he works out things for the good of his people through his governance of creation, through his works of providence, as the 1689 would put it. And we see this uh, again in verse 4 to 8. The bow of the mighty are broken, but feeble bind on strength. Verse 6, the Lord kills and brings to life. Verse 7, the Lord makes poor and makes rich. And look at the end of verse 8. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he set the world. The pillars of the earth are the Lord's. What holds up the earth is the Lord's. He ensures that the globe spins, at the speed that it spins, he ensures that the winds blow at the speed that they blow. He ensures that the grasshopper leaps a certain distance. He ensures that kings are raised and kings are brought down. All these things are done by the Lord. Can you imagine? One of the things that amazes me and uh, at my own free time, one of the things I love watching is uh, documentaries on space. You know, there are probably billions of planets out there. And the Lord decided to put humanity on earth. There are billions of meteorites just moving past the earth. Some of them, uh, you know, even the best equipments can't see. The Lord controls them. Stars are shining billions of miles away. The Lord controls that. I mean, it's amazing. And yet this same God controls even that which happens in our own lives. And all those things 
happen for the good of his kingdom. In the first part of this prayer, Hannah rejoices in what, in, in what she sees, uh, or rather she, what she has experienced in God's saving power. But in the next part of this prayer, her faith goes beyond her own experience. So in the first part, it is what God has done for her in her own life, her own experience. But the next part, verse 4 to 8, goes beyond her own experience, to God's unseen governing of things. Ralph Davies, uh, one of the commentators, puts it this way. We have moved from micro-salvation to macro-salvation. So God's salvation or God's work of controlling our lives, and now she's looking at how God controls all creation, how his kingdom reigns over all creation. The Lord dealings with Hannah in making her barren and later satisfying her were all in God's control. The Lord makes barren and the Lord gives children. And again, this is why we, we need to be very careful it is very wrong for us to mock someone because they do not have a certain uh, capability. It is the Lord who makes blind, the Lord who makes deaf. In this, in the Lord making her barren and in the Lord satisfying her later, we see that Penina's sharp words are silenced and this is a picture of how the Lord governs the earth, as we see in verse 5. The small acts of salvation in our lives are but small evidences that God is king and that he controls the universe for our good. It is the Lord who, if we look at it in a macro salvation way, it is the Lord who gives power to make wealth? The nations that are wealthy today, it is the Lord who has given them power to make wealth. And it is the Lord who takes away the power to make wealth. As my Matthew Henry puts it, advancement and abasement are both in the hands of the Lord. Advancement and abasement are both in God's hand. It is a comfort to know that our God has not only saved us and made us his, but that this same God governs all that happens around us for our good, for the good of his church. That even as we look at what is happening, especially right now with the pandemic, you might look and wonder, how is it that a virus that infects bats, of all the creatures, bats, suddenly becomes transmissible to human beings and has caused the whole world to come at a standstill? It is the Lord who governs. Whether it was created in the lab as people would say, whether it just occurred naturally, the Lord controlled every process of that bacteria becoming infectious to human beings. And that, dear saints, is for our good. We cannot see it, but it is for our good. We must see how Hannah shows that uh, adversity is part of God's plan for his people. Even the current adversity that we are going through right now, we are not able to meet. We are having financial challenges. So many challenges around the world. 
adversity is part of God's plan for his people. Look at this. The raising of the bow gives an opportunity for God's power to be displayed when he breaks the bow of the mighty. Do you see that in verse 5? Uh, the, the, the bow of the mighty is broken. Sorry, verse 4. The bow of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. The Lord allows the wicked to hold the bow only for him to show his power to break it. It is in death that the Lord shows his power to raise the dead, as we see in verse 6. The Lord kills and the Lord brings to life. He brings death. He brings tragedy so that he shows that he is a God who raises the dead. He is a God who gives life. He is a God who gives restoration. It is from the needy, uh, from need and poverty that the Lord reveals his power to grant wealth, strength, and satisfaction. As we see in verse 7, the Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. The Lord made Hannah barren so that he could show himself to be the God who is able to satisfy the barren woman. That the barren woman can be satisfied in the Lord. The Lord is denying us today whatever it would be that he is denying us. To show us that he is able to sustain us in spite of financial meltdown all around the world. That he has good for us even when pestilence surrounds us everywhere we look. The Lord orchestrates all life's events, whether great or small, good or bad, to achieve his good purpose for us. Have you ever thought what it would, be, what, what it would have been like if Penina wasn't in the picture? Can you imagine if chapter 1 of Samuel didn't have Penina or her mockings. Yes, we would rejoice. But the fact that there, Penina was there mocking Hannah. Pushing Hannah. Making her anxious. Making her depressed and stressed. Then it heightened the joy of God bringing deliverance to her. Penina's mockings brought earnest prayer and it has made God's answer even sweeter. It's just the same way that in books and in movies, the stronger the, um, the enemy the sweeter the victory, isn't it? Can you imagine reading a book, a fictional book about an enemy who is weak and is knocked down within one page of the book? It's not an interesting book. Or watching a movie where the enemy is such a weakling that within uh, 10 minutes, ten, first 10 minutes of the movie, he's been knocked out. I mean, you would, by the time he's knocked down, you would stop watching it. But how we are on the edge of our seats when you have this big, strong, ugly, powerful enemy coming towards the heroes. Because when this Goliath is knocked down, oh, what a joy we have at the end. And that's how God orchestrates things in his own way. In our own lives, he brings 
thorns in the flesh, just like he brought thorns in the flesh of Paul. Why? So that he may be humble. And that humility is, glo is more glorious and more beautiful. And the strength of God is, uh, and the grace of God is even more magnified in our weaknesses. That's why the Lord brings challenges as he governs creation. Why do we have the pandemic today? I can't tell you the exact reasons, but this is what I can tell you. The Lord means it for our good. We should see the same in our lives that God is governing the universe and allows the bow to be raised against us. You might look and wonder, why is the Lord allowing the bow to be aimed at me and to be shot at me? It's because when he breaks that bow, what joy, what rejoicing will come to us. Whether it be mockings coming our way, poverty assailing us, all these things work out to accomplish a good purpose in our lives. And this reminds me of the words in Romans chapter 8, that all things, not some things, all things work out for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Even those things that are hard and painful, the Lord will break that bow. But then, finally, as we have seen, the Lord saves his people. The Lord governs creation. The Lord governs providence. We also see in verse 9 and 10 that the Lord will judge the wicked. As we look at God's uh, a view, as we have a glimpse of the kingdom of God, we see that, that God not only saves, God not only controls what's happening in our lives, but God will ultimately judge the wicked. We see this in verse 9 and 10. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder, in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. And again, as Hannah is praying this uh, prayer and singing this song, she is first of all looking at her own self. She is looking at her own life. That the Lord has brought judgment. And the Lord will bring judgment to the wicked, even in her own home. Because Penina, who used to mock her, has now been disgraced. The disgracing of Penina and the vindication of Hannah is a model size demonstration of what God will do at the end of age. That the wicked will be eternally ashamed. Just as Penina was ashamed, that was just a small glimpse of what will happen to the wicked. And just as Hannah was vindicated, that's how the righteous will be vindicated as the Lord judges the wicked. Her personal experience is a sneak peek of what God plans. It is not enough that Hannah was rewarded by the Lord. It is not enough that Hannah was given a child. But her reward is completed and is made full by the judgment of the wicked who mock and taunt her. The culmination of God's ark of salvation is the judgment of the wicked. We see that the Lord rewards the righteous by guarding them, but the wicked are cast off into darkness. We see that in verse 9. 
So the Lord guides, it's not enough that the Lord guides the righteous, but the Lord guides the righteous and he will cast, or the, the, the wicked will be cast or left to go into darkness. The faithful depend on God's leading and God's governance of their lives, while the wicked depend on their own might. The wicked depend on their own strength. They look at what they have by their own power, and they rejoice in that. But the righteous depend on God, and they look to God. And again, Hannah is saying, I didn't have the strength to have children. My rival had the strength to have children, and many of them, and she's boasting in that. But I will boast in the Lord. The judgment of God is seen in how he abandons the wicked to stumble and fall into darkness. Because they want to seek their own way, because they are wise in their own way, the Lord leaves them to stumble into darkness. They have no guide. They have no help in this life. And what an awful judgment to be abandoned into darkness, into the darkness of your own ways by the king of the universe. If you are watching me and you are an unbeliever, there is nothing as awful as the Lord leaving you to go into darkness. It will be like a, a ship, a small ship, going into darkness, going into a wood that is full of wolves, that is dark, that sheep cannot even see the wolf coming towards it. That's a picture of the wicked. As you go your own way, as you, quote-unquote, are the captain of your own life, guess what you're doing? You are guiding yourself deeper and deeper into the wood that is dark, surrounded by all kinds of creatures ready to devour you. What an awful predicament. But for the righteous, the Lord is their guide. The Lord holds their hands. And this is especially the fate of Eli's sons, Hophni and Phineas, who we'll hopefully see next time, who did not follow the law of the Lord. They decided to do things on their own way. And what happened? They got lost. And they died in their sins. Oh, unbeliever who is listening to this. You do not want to live this life in your own ways. You do not want to walk in this life in your own wisdom. Judgment, darkness, deep darkness is awaiting you. Repent. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul. But the judgment of the wicked is not only passive where Lord abandons, the Lord abandons them to their own way, but it is active. So we see them being abandoned, but we also see an active judgment upon the wicked. And we see this in verse 10. What happens? They are broken to pieces. This is now active. It is both passive and active. The Lord will break them into pieces. The Lord will thunder from heaven in judgment against them. And this is a picture of the final judgment when the Lord will dash the nations with an iron scepter from his judgment throne. But Hannah's prayer of judgment is prophetic. So it's not only talking about her own life, but it is also prophetic. She's looking into the future, what the Lord is about to do. It is prophetic, and it will be partially be fulfilled in the king soon to be anointed by her son as the deliverer of Israel. The Lord is about to raise up a king who will be anointed by Samuel, Hannah's own son, the Lord will raise King David 
who will bring judgment on the enemy nation surrounding Israel. And that's why you see the victories of David being listed after he becomes king. Why? That is God's judgment on the wicked. So Hannah's prayer is prophetic in that way. It foresaw the judgment of the wicked nations at the hand of David. But it reaches further and it reaches to the king, Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom all, uh, in who alone the lofty anticipations of Hannah are completely realized. So it will be partially be fulfilled in David, but it will be fully attained when the great son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, will come and he will judge the wicked. In him will full salvation be attained. And in him will all the enemies of God's people be defeated. Look at Colossians. If you just turn to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. Speaking about Christ, look at what the Bible says. He, okay, uh, let me just read from uh, verse 14. Uh, by counseling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. So Christ will counsel the legal demands of the law and therefore save us. And this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. But look at verse 15. He disarmed rulers and authorities and put them to what? Open shame by triumphing over them in him. Just as Penina's words were shaming Hannah, the Lord is about to do a greater thing in Christ. He has done a greater thing in Christ. He has ashamed. He has brought law the rulers of the, and, and authorities of the universe. He is speaking about the devil who tempted our first parents into sin. He is speaking about sin and the slavery to sin that we are in. We need a savior from sin. It's only through the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we can gain this. There is no victory against your master, sin. There is no victory against your master, the devil, you who doesn't believe in Christ. Apart from putting your faith, putting your hope in Christ, hoping in him alone. For us as believers, that's something to rejoice in. That the enemies of God's people will be destroyed. Whether they be spiritual enemies or human enemies. If we look around the world right now and we see how the church is being persecuted in China, what hope do we have? What hope do we have in this world when we see the injustice happening all around us? The only hope we have and the consolation that we have is that these rulers will be judged. They will be ashamed on that day when the Lord appears. Though right now they appear to win, their judgment is here. If you look at the book of Revelation, it speaks beautifully. Again, that's a, a book that gives us a view of God's kingdom, how God has been governing things throughout time for the good of his kingdom. And look at the climax of uh, every, uh, every passage or every moment in history. What is the climax? Judgment. When Babylon the Great is judged, when the beasts and uh, the, 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 its prophets are judged, when the devil is judged. Notice that, by the way, when you read the book of 
revelation. That's the, always the climax. Judgment, judgment, judgment. And then the salvation of the saints. This is something for you and I to have peace and hope and comfort in. That although we live in a world that is corrupt, full of uh, pain, that the Lord is orchestrating all this for our good and that the Lord will bring judgment to our enemies. To the unbeliever, look at this passage in Acts 17 verse 31. We are told that he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom, whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance, by raise, uh, assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Will Jesus Christ be your judge or will he be your savior? The Lord right now, through his words, through his word, calls you to repent and put your hope in him. Do not trust in your own strength. We have seen here that not by might shall a man prevail. You cannot be saved by your own might, by your own righteousness, by your own good works. It is only by Christ. Turn to him. For the saints have hope in this. The Lord saves. The Lord governs. The Lord will bring judgment. What great hope we have.